The making in the modern world. Railroads. Table of contents. Railroads were a key part of the Industrial Revolution and the development of the modern world. The development of steam engines and the iron and steel industries were integrally related to railroads. And the steam locomotives and the railroad network were essential parts of the Industrial Revolution. Even to the present time, it is the railroads that carry a major part of the world's freight. Narration by Dr. Sidney Soclough, Zoe Phonemes, and Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.1/yt navigator. Introduction: Railroads and Transportation. Tramways, the world's first railways were a response to the coal transport problem. Tramways were wooden, low-friction tracks, easing the way for horses to draw coal wagons down to wharves at the river. The world's first railway bridge, the Kazi Arch, built in 1726. Early Railroads Early steam engines were highly inefficient. Only about 1% of the thermal energy in the steam was converted into mechanical energy. This inefficiency resulted from the fact that a piston could not make a downward stroke until cold water had been sent into the cylinder to condense the steam. This process wasted time and steam because the cylinder had to be reheated before new steam could push the piston up again. James Watt in 1764, hit upon a clever solution to this problem. His solution was to draw the steam out of the cylinder using a vacuum pump and condense the steam in a separate chamber. He encased the cylinder in a steam-filled jacket to keep it from cooling. This dramatically increased the efficiency of the steam engine and made it a practical and widely used device. This shows the evolution of the early steam engines. From Savory's engine of 1698 to Newcomen in 1705 to Watt's engine in 1769. James Watt, in 1781, also invented the sun and planet gear to produce a continuous revolving motion to an axle or shaft. In 1782, what patented the double-action steam engine that delivered power in both the up and the down strokes. He also patented the parallel motion mechanism that increased the efficiency of the rocker arm connection to the sun and planet wheels. Railroads originated as a means of carrying coal out of mines. Two parallel wooden beams or trams we fixed to the ground and furnished with flanges to prevent the wheels from slipping off the beams. Later, iron strips were attached to the top of the beams to prolong their life. And later, iron beams were used, the precursor to the modern railway. With improved boiler design, the British engineer Richard Trevithick built a non-condensing steam-driven carriage in 1801 and the first steam locomotive in 1803, though its boiler later exploded. The first steam locomotive to run on rails was built by Richard Trevithick in 1803. It could haul 20 tons at a speed of 5 miles per hour. A key factor in Trevithick's engine was feeding the steam exhausted from the locomotive cylinders up the smokestack. This produced a vacuum that drew air through the firebox. An increase in steam flowing up the smokestack resulted in a faster burning of fuel and more steam. The steam exhausted from the locomotive cylinders after it had pushed the pistons and went up the smokestack through a nozzle produced the choo choo sound. This also had the effect of creating a vacuum that sucked the air through the firebox in step with how hard the locomotive was working.
the more steam that went up the smokestack. The faster the fuel burned, and the more steam was generated. The Stockton and Darlington Railroad opened in England in 1825 and was the first true railroad. It significantly reduced the cost of transporting coal and demonstrated that large profits could be made by building railways. Railroads were a unique form of highway, and no one knew when they first began as businesses how they would be so different from turnpikes and canals. In 1829, George Stevenson built his successful rocket locomotive. It contributed to the rapid expansion of railroads in Great Britain and later in other countries. This is the rocket locomotive. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway was the world's first intercity passenger railway in which all the trains were run on a schedule and were hauled for most of the distance solely by steam locomotives. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway opened in 1830 and ran for 31 miles between the cities of Liverpool and Manchester in northwest England. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway was built primarily to provide faster transport of raw materials and finished goods between Liverpool, the most important port in the north of England, and the mills in Manchester and surrounding towns, the centre of the textile industry. The proposed Liverpool and Manchester Railway was a serious economic threat to the Bridgewater Canal, which was making a fortune by shipping goods between Liverpool and Manchester. Railroads in the United States The first railroad in North America was the Baltimore and Ohio, chartered by Baltimore merchants. The Essex was built for the Morris and Essex Railroad in 1838 by Seth Boyden of Newark, New Jersey. The locomotive had a tender, four pilot wheels, and driving wheels at the rear of the engine. The locomotive weighed six tons with 8.5 by 26 inch cylinders and 53.5 inch driving wheels. With the addition of a cab for the engineer and fireman and a cow catcher on the front. This is a standard steam locomotive. Matthias Baldwin invented the flexible beam truck or six-wheel connected engine in 1842. He aimed to use all the locomotive's weight for traction. With this arrangement, the two front pairs of wheels could move laterally, their axles working in cylindrical. Vertical pedestals. The pedestals were held by beams that could move independently of each other and the engine's main frame. The rear pair of drivers were mounted in the conventional way, and coupling rods connected all the wheels. This design permitted operation on curves without binding any of the wheels. The first 10 wheel or 4-6-0 locomotive was the Chesapeake. It was designed by Septimus Norris and built in 1847 for the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. It weighed 22 tons, with 14.5 by 22 inch cylinders and driving wheels that weigh 46 inches in diameter. The Irvington was the first coal burner on the Hudson River Railroad. It was constructed by the Lawrence Machine Shop of Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1852. All the elements of the standard steam locomotive are present in this design. When the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad first opened for business, anyone was allowed to use the tracks for a fee. Wagons equipped with the proper wheels and pulled by horses we use on the tracks. It soon became obvious to everyone that this model was not going to work. Even with occasional sightings, wagons met going in opposite directions. And there was nowhere to pull over as on a canal or turnpike. <laughs> 
It quickly became apparent that railroads had to own the right of way, the highway, and the rolling stock use on the highway. The states granted railroad corporate charters. Initially, this required special legislation. But later on, general laws were enacted that set up a formal administrative procedure to grant articles of incorporation. The Transcontinental Pacific Railroads were the only ones to receive charters from the federal government. Most importantly, and the reason why railroads were very unusual, the state would grant the railroad the Poe of eminent domain, that superior dominion of the sovereign Poe of a property within the state, which authorizes it to appropriate it for public use. One. Without such Pui, the railroad could not construct its line over the best possible route without being blackmailed by property owners. 2. Poeva. It was a two-edged sword, making the railroads politically vulnerable to those who lived along its right-of-way. The railroads eclipsed the canals. By 1840, there were about 3,000 miles of railroad trackage in the United States. That was almost the same mileage as the canals. By the Civil War, about $1.2 billion had been invested in the railroads of which about 25 to 30 percent was government funds. By 1849, freight receipts exceeded passenger receipts. The Railroad Decade, 1850 to 1860. Between 1850 and 1860, 22,500 miles of railroad line were built, increasing the total mileage from 7,500 in 1850 to 30,000 in 1860. Of the total built in this decade, 10,000 miles were built in the Midwest. In 1849, Chicago only had one short line. By 1854, Chicago was the leading rail center in the U.S. In 1856, a railroad bridge was built across the Mississippi River at Rock Island between Iowa and Illinois, allowing the shipment of Midwestern grains directly to Chicago via rail. Before 1850, the great majority of the agricultural products of the Mississippi Valley went south through New Orleans. By 1860, the railroads had primarily taken over this traffic from the Mississippi River and the Western Canals. By 1860, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin replaced Pennsylvania, New York and Ohio as the leading wheat-growing states. The railroads quickly became the dominant form of transportation. The reasons we 1. Greater speed, for the first time in human history. People can travel faster than a galloping horse on land. 2. Open year around, railroads could run in the rain, snow, ice and cold. Consequently, Goods could be shipped around anywhere in the country. So businesses could also run around. 3. Less transshipment, before the railroads. Gaining a shipment of supplies from New York City to a dry goods business in Cleveland, Ohio, was a formidable task. The goods first had to be purchased from wholesalers in New York City. Then, transportation to Cleveland had to be arranged. Typically, this meant shipping the goods up the Hudson River on a steamboat to the entrance of the Erie Canal. The goods would then be transferred to a canal boat for shipment to Buffalo. They would be transferred from Buffalo to another steamboat for the trip across the lake to Cleveland. If the business was inland from Cleveland, the goods would have to be unloaded in Cleveland and transferred to wagons for the journey inland.
arranging these complicated shipments was a job for experts. James J. Hill and John D. Rockefeller were commission merchants early in their careers. 4. Concentrated Responsibility This is another aspect of the previous point. Shippers could deal with a single freight agent and arrange to ship their goods long distances. As the railroads grew ever larger, they captured an increasing percentage of the freight business, and their productivity grew rapidly. In the 1830s, freight rates were about dollar. 075 per ton mile and passenger rates were about 5 cents per mile. By 1859, these rates had fallen to dollar 0258 and dollar 0244, respectively. The eight wheel freight car was introduced during this period and rail weights increased from 13.5 pounds per foot to 59.5 pounds per foot. These were still iron rails. Steel rails began to be used extensively in the 1870s. Locomotives also got much larger. In 1830, just before the era of the railroads, it took a week to go from New York City to Cleveland, two weeks to get to Detroit, and three weeks to reach Chicago. This shows the time required to travel from New York City to various places in the U.S. in 1857. The rail network east of the Mississippi River was now so dense that almost any place in this eastern region could be reached in less than one week. By 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, Rail passengers could travel from Boston to St. Louis in 48 hours or from New York to Charleston, South Carolina, in 62 hours. One cannot point to a specific date and say, that was the first big business. Like most things, the railroads emerged slowly with much trial and error. But by the early to mid-1850s, the Great Trunk Line Railroads, such as the New York Central Pennsylvania B and O and Erie, were big businesses with recognizably modern management structures. From 1851 to 1852, the Erie reached Dunkirk, New York, the Pennsylvania reached Pittsburgh, and the Baltimore and Ohio reached Wheeling, West Virginia in 1856. The Pennsylvania Railroad acquired working control of the 468-mile-long Pittsburgh Fort Wayne and Chicago Railroad, giving the Pennsylvania Railroad a continuous route from Philadelphia to Chicago. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was the first railroad in the U.S. It was chartered in 1827 and construction began in 1828. The first city to take an active role in railroads was Baltimore, which in the 1820s had become the second largest American city. On July 4, 1828, Baltimore merchants began the construction of the railroad from the harbor to some point, then undetermined, on the Ohio River. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was chartered in 1827 four years after the first charter of the Philadelphia and Columbia lines. Still, it was not until about 1830 that the first 12 mites were completed in August of that year. The Tom Thumb locomotive, designed by Peter Cooper, a New York inventor, made a successful trip of 13 miles from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills, Maryland. This horska built in 1829 and drawn by the fastest trotters, made numerous runs on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad before steam buoy was introduced. It was found that one horse could haul a load of freight on rails equal to the effort of 12 horses on a turnpike. Passengers we carried at the speed of 12 to 15 miles and who this is the Tom Thumb in 1829.
when the horse and other means of traction failed to meet the freight and passenger service needs on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Peter Cooper, a New York inventor, built this locomotive, the Tom Thumb, in 1829. The engine made its first successful trip from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills in August 1830. It pushed a small open car with 18 passengers, covered the 13 miles in 75 minutes non-stop, and returned in 57 minutes. In August 1830, the Tom Thumb made a 13-mile run from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills, pulling a single car carrying the directors of the B&O. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was the first steam-operated railway in the United States to be chartered as a common carrier of freight and passengers, 1827. Baltimore merchants established the B&O Railroad Company to compete with New York merchants and their newly opened Erie Canal for trade to the West. The results of adopting British practice were generally bad. Forcing the engineers to design a railroad from scratch. Locomotives designed and built in Baltimore were stronger than those of Robert Stevenson. On the Camden and Amboy Railroad. An oath a pioneering line. The engineer John Jervis invented the T-cross-section rail that greatly cheapened and simplified track laying when combined with the wooden crossy. Also first introduced in the U.S. Simplicity and strength became the basic test for railroad components in North America. On cars, the individual trucks were given four wheels to carry heavier loads and the outside dimensions of cars were enlarged. The first stone for the line was laid on July 4, 1828 by Charles Carroll, the American revolutionary leader and last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence. The first 13 miles of line from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills, Maryland, now Ellicott City, Opened in 1830, the Tickle Tom Thumb steam locomotive ran over this line and demonstrated to doubters that steam traction was feasible on the steep winding grades. The railroad was extended to Wheeling, Virginia, now in West Virginia, 379 miles, 610 kilometers, in 1852. In the 1860s and 70s, the railroad reached Chicago, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri. We see again that in the 1860s and 70s, the railroad reached Chicago, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri. In 1896, the B&O went bankrupt. It grew further after being reorganized in 1899, reaching Cleveland, Ohio on Lake Erie in 1901 and 1963. The B&O was acquired by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Company and, in 1980, became part of the newly formed CSX Corporation. The B&O's long-distance passenger trains were discontinued in 1971 when the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, Amtrak, took over intercity passenger service. However, it continued limited commuter service in Washington, D.C. and Pittsburgh. About one quarter of B&O's freight revenues came from its traditional haulage of bituminous coal from mines in the Allegheny Mountains. Other critical freight includes motor vehicles and parts, as well as chemicals. In western Maryland, the engineers were faced with their steepest grades. These came to be known as the ruling grade, that is, the amount of locomotive power required for the transit of a line was determined by its steepest grade. Robert Stevenson had thought 1% was the steepest grade a locomotive could surmount. At the top of the climb over the Allegheny Front, the Baltimore and Ohio B&O 
engineers had to accept a 17-mile grade of about 2.2%, which they managed to achieve with the stronger American engines. Adopted later as the ruling grade for the Canadian Pacific and several other North American lines, the 2.2% figure has become so fixed that it now ranks second only to standard gauge as a characteristic of the North American Railroad. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was finally completed in 1852 to Wheeling, Virginia, now West Virginia. But by that time, it was only the first of what turned out to be six Trans-Appalachian Railroads completed in 1851 and 1852. This is the Atlantic Locomotive. Built in York, Pennsylvania. In 1832 by Phineas Davis. Ox teams were used to convey the engine to Baltimore. It made a successful first trip between Baltimore and Ellicott's Mills, Maryland. A distance of 13 miles. The Atlantic was in service for 60 years and can still run under its own steam. Almost a year later, in 1831, the DeWitt Clinton pulled a train between Albany and Schenectady in New York. The American Railroad came into existence because incomplete geographic knowledge caused the first British colonists to plant early interports in what were later understood to be unfavorable locations. The uplands in central Massachusetts were already being abandoned for agricultural use when the railroad arrived in the region in the mid-1830s. Only when in the 1840s, a railroad reached into the agricultural belt in the American Midwest could the port of Boston find a great interland. And by 1825, the Erie Canal had created a water connection between the Midwest and the port of New York. Two other colonial ports mirrored the conditions in Boston in Maryland. The rivers did not serve the colonial port at Baltimore. The Susquehanna just to the north and the Potomac just to the south had waterfalls near their mouths. A port had grown up at Alexandria on the Virginia side of the Potomac. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania built a canal and later a railroad to keep inland trade from passing southward to Baltimore in South Carolina. The main port, Charleston, was, like Boston, on a short stream offering little access to the interior. Baltimore was also a major city and port in colonial America. Again, as in the case of Boston and Philadelphia, the mountains were a major barrier to canal building. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was started in 1828 from a point near Washington, D.C and was initially intended to reach the Ohio River at Pittsburgh. The canal was completed in 1850 but went only 185 miles to Cumberland, Maryland. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was soon superseded by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which eventually went over the mountains to reach the Ohio River at Wheeling, Virginia, now West Virginia in 1853. Although this boosted Baltimore as a port, it was too late to compete with New York City. These mislocated colonial ports were among the largest American cities. But they were denied the easy access to the interior that seemed essential for growth as the country spread inward. The creation of the railroad offered a solution to the access problem. Competition among the Atlantic ports meant that those with the poorest river connections to the west, namely, Baltimore, Boston and Charleston, became the earliest and strongest proponents of railroad promotion. In Maryland, the rivers did not serve the colonial port at Baltimore. The Susquehanna just to the north and the Potomac just to the south had waterfalls near their mouths. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania built a canal and later a railroad to keep inland trade from passing southward to Baltimore. 
in South Carolina, the main port, Charleston, was, like Boston, on a short stream offering little access to the interior. The Camden and Amboy Railroad and Transportation Company, usually shortened to the Camden and Amboy Railroad, is one of the oldest railroads in North America. It was incorporated in 1830 and opened its first line in 1832 between Camden, New Jersey and South Amboy, New Jersey. This is the main line of the Camden and Amboy in 1869. Camden is across the Delaware River from Philadelphia, and Amboy is just across from Staten Island and New York City. This is the Camden and Amboy Railroad, with the engine planet, in 1834, by Edward Lamson. In October 1830 Robert Stevens, President and Chief Engineer of the Camden and Amboy Railroad went to England to purchase rails and a locomotive for the company in the passage. He invented the T-rail and the hook-headed spike for fastening it. Both are still in use today. In October 1830 Robert Stevens, President and Chief Engineer of the Camden and Amboy Railroad went to England to purchase rails and a locomotive for the company. On the passage he invented the T-rail, see next topic, and a hook-headed spike for fastening it, both are still in use today. The Camden and Amboy was the first railroad to use wooden railroad ties and T-section rails. A railroad tie, or cross tie in American English, railway tie in Canadian English, or railway sleeper in Australian and British English, is a support for the rails and railroad tracks. Wooden ties are used on many traditional railways and the background is a track with concrete ties. The first locomotive for the railroad was the John Bull built by George and Robert Stevenson and shipped to Philadelphia from England in 1831. The John Bull went into regular service in 1833 when there was enough trackage for the C&I to begin operations. The John Bull was modified to have a plate in the leading axle to handle curves better. A two-wheeled cow catcher was added to the front of the locomotive to help the locomotive navigate curves and also to divert any stray cows on the tracks. The Strasbourg Railroad is the oldest continuously operated railroad in the country and is still in business. The Strasbourg Railroad was chartered in 1832 and today is a heritage railroad offering excursion trains hauled by steam locomotives on a 4-mile, 6.5 kilometers, track in Pennsylvania Dutch Country in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. Telegraph and Big Business By 1856, telegraph control of railroad operations became widespread. In the beginning, the telegraph companies were independent companies that paid for the privilege of putting their poles along the railroad's right of way. Some railroads took over the telegraph operations, while others continued to contract the service. Every railroad station had a telegraph operator. The trunk lines completed by the mid 1850s were forced to pioneer new ways of corporate management. No railroads before this period had the traffic volume and mileage to raise complex administrative problems. In 1855, it cost about $2 million to run the railroad in comparison. The largest non-railroad businesses were the huge New England textile mill complexes, requiring only about $300,000 to run the largest of these mills. By the late 1880s, the Pennsylvania Railroad employed over 50,000 men. This was an order of magnitude increase compared to businesses before the Civil War. The trunk line railroads were spread over a vast territory 
shops, terminals, stations, warehouses, office buildings, telegraph lines, bridges and road beds needed to be administered and maintained. Coordination was complex. Every day, stations loaded different amounts of freight. And every day, a variety of traffic had to be dealt with. Cargos were unpredictable and could come from anywhere and go anywhere. Consequently, short-term decisions had to be made daily, accepting and directing large quantities of freight daily. And long-term decisions had to be made about what level to set freight rates. With such complexities, complex organizational structures evolved to manage them. Compare this to the textile mill where the works could be viewed within an hour, and decisions could be made slowly in contrast. The railroad was spread over a large area, and weeks were required to view the physical plant. Decisions had to be made quickly because the freight's condition and the passenger safety required it. Now, compare the railroad to a canal spread over a large area. A waiver. The canal did not run, maintain, or repay the equipment used. The locks could run independently, and the speed of the barges was plodding. For these reasons, the B&O Erie and Pennsylvania Railroad significantly contributed to modern management science. Between them, they fashioned the earliest large-scale administrative structure in American business. The Evolution of Steam Locomotives in America The first steam locomotive to run on rails was built by Richard Trevithick in 1803. It could haul 20 tons at the speed of 5 miles per hoo. This is the locomotive called Catch Me Who Can. The Granite Railway was established in 1826 as a horse-drawn railway. It is the oldest railroad in the U.S., having been laid out for the transportation of granite from quarries in Quincy to be used in the building of the Bunker Hill Monument in Charlestown. It was in 1825 on the Granite Railroad just south of Boston that several of the characteristic features of American railroading, such as the swiveling truck and the four-wheel truck, were first put into use. The Granite Railway was one of the first railroads in the United States, built to convey granite from Quincy, Massachusetts, to construct the Bunker Hill Monument. The last active quarry closed in 1963. In 1985, Boston's Metropolitan District Commission purchased 22 acres, including Granite Railway Quarry, as the Quincy Quarry's reservation. The father of American railroads was Colonel John Stevens of Hoboken, New Jersey. As early as 1811, he proposed building a railroad in New Jersey and in 1815 and 1819 made further proposals. But he could not obtain the necessary financing. In 1825, Stevens decided to prove, at his own expense, that railroads and locomotives were a practical possibility. Consequently, he built a small circular railway on his Hoboken estate and had a locomotive built that ran on it. Finally, in 1830, Stevens and his sons Robert L. and Edward I were granted a charter for the Camden and Amboy Railroad and Transportation Company. The earliest locomotives used in North America were of British design in 1829. The Stewart Bridge Line was the first to run on a North American railroad. But on the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, where the Stewart Bridge Line ran, as on the Champlain and St. Lawrence Railroad, the first in Canada, Stevenson locomotives proved unsuited to the crude track and quickly derailed.
The British locomotive had virtually no constructive impact on North American locomotives. The only residual characteristic was the forefoot, eight and a half inch gauge, which was often considered a misfortune in being too narrow. The brute strength of American locomotives. They great tolerance of cheap and crude track. They durability. They economy of operation. And they simplicity of maintenance determined almost from the first years of operation that there would be a distinctively American railroad sharing little with British practice. Once the British had shown that railroads could be made to work, the Americans reinvented them for a very different terrain, economic climate, and demographic level. The creation of the American Railroad was a contemporaneous but not a derivative development. The South Carolina Railroad The South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company was a railroad in South Carolina that operated from 1830 to 1844. It provided the first steam-powered, scheduled passenger train service in the United States. This shows the 136-mile route of railroad from Charleston to Hamburg, built and operated by the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company. Its name was changed to South Carolina Railroad Company in 1843. Merchants in Charleston launched an early railroad called the South Carolina Railroad, which at 130 miles was by some measure the longest rail line in the world when it opened in 1833. Horatio Allen was appointed chief engineer in 1829 and recommended that only steam be used for traction. The first locomotive purchased by the railroad was the best friend of Charleston. The locomotive was built in New York and shipped by sea to South Carolina. The best friend of Charleston was the first locomotive in America to pull cars. By 1834, the line had purchased 15 locomotives and scheduled one daily run in each direction. The railroad was constructed very cheaply. Where it could not be laid on cross ties placed directly on the flatter gently sloping surface of the flat coastal plain, it was elevated frequently over long distances, on timber pilings to allow water to pass beneath the track. The object was to divert the flow of cotton from the port of Savannah, Georgia, to Charleston, the older and larger port in South Carolina. This was to be a regional rail line with just a single locomotive. This is the schedule for passenger travel in 1844 between Charleston and Hamburg in South Carolina. This is a pass and ticket for the South Carolina Railroad. Three Massachusetts railroads we chartered and under construction in 1830, showing a strong affinity for British practice. The Boston and Lowell, Boston and Providence, and Boston and Worcester railroads radiated from the metropolis to towns no more than 45 miles away, in 1835. When all we operating, Boston became the world's first rail hub. An event of transforming importance to the future of Boston and New England occurred in 1835. The inauguration of the region's first steam-powered railroads three of them in a single year, and all headquartered in Boston. Each of these pioneer railroad lines ran from Boston to a major population center to the northwest or south, the Boston and Lowell stretched northward, to the region's key textile center, the Boston and Providence southwest to the principal power of neighboring Rhode Island and the Boston and Worcester due west to Massachusetts' largest interior city. With the opening of these lines in mid-1835, Boston became, temporarily at least, the railroading capital of the nation. The first train on the Boston and Lowell Railroad opened in 1835.
There was no cab. And the engineer was in the open. Rain or snow. Construction on the Boston and Providence Railroad started in 1832. And it opened in 1835. Construction on the Boston and Worcester Railroad started in 1832. And the line was completed to Worcester in 1835. Through mergers, it became part of the Boston and Albany Railroad. Through mergers, the Boston and Worcester Railroad became part of the Boston and Albany Railroad in 1870. The New York Central Railroad The New York Central Railroad was a railroad primarily operating in the Great Lakes and Mid-Atlantic regions of the United States. The railroad primarily connected Greater New York and Boston in the east with Chicago and St. Louis in the Midwest. The New York Central Railroad was known as the Water Level Route, as its main line to New York City ran along the Hudson River and the shores of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. This is a map of the Water Level Route of the New York Central Railroad, purple. The West Shore Railroad, red. And the Erie Canal, blue. The railroad was established in 1853 consolidating several existing railroad companies. This is an 1876 map of the New York Central Railroad. This is an 1893 map of the New York Central Railroad. This is a 1900 map of railroads in the northeastern U.S. This is a 1918 map of railroads in the northeastern U.S. This is a map of the New York Central Railroad in 1926. The New York Central Railroad merged with its former rival, the Pennsylvania Railroad, in 1968 to form Penn Central. Penn Central went bankrupt in 1970 and merged into Conrail in 1976. Conrail was broken up in 1999 and portions of its system were transferred to CSX and Norfolk Southern Railway. CSX acquired most of the old New York Central trackage. The Pennsylvania Railroad Philadelphia was the largest city in colonial America. The Allegheny Mountains, however, were a major barrier to canal building. Also, the major rivers in western Pennsylvania, the Delaware and the Susquehanna, ran mostly north to south. The Port of Philadelphia was established more than 300 years ago during the colonial period and was, for a time, the busiest port in both that period and the earliest years of the New Republic. Philadelphia had a disadvantage. However, of being located 103 miles up the Delaware River from the ocean and was finally eclipsed by the Port of New York. The Pennsylvania Canal, which connected Philadelphia to the Ohio River at Pittsburgh, was completed in 1834. However, by the time, New York City, with its Syria Canal completed almost 10 years earlier, had an unbeatable head start. The Pennsylvania Canal faced far more obstacles than the Erie Canal in going over the rugged Allegheny Mountains. Inclined planes and portage railroads were needed in some sections, making it far more expensive than the Erie Canal, and it was never profitable. In 1852, the Pennsylvania Railroad was completed over the Allegheny Mountains from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, rendering the canal obsolete. Later, there were connections to the Great Lakes and the entire Midwest. However, a railroad connection paralleling the Erie Canal all of the way to the Great Lakes at Buffalo had been completed by 1842, so New York City maintained its primacy.
The geography that led to the leading role of New York City was also a factor in Pittsburgh. Situated at the beginning of the Ohio River at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers. The development of steamboats in the 1840s and the arrival of the railroad in 1852 made Pittsburgh a major transportation and industrial center. The Pennsylvania Railroad is known as the standard railway of the world. The Pennsylvania Railroad as the standard railroad of the world, also strove for an air of permanence, decorating its railroad stations with symbols of itself, such as the Pennsylvania Herald, shown above a Newark Penn station. This is an 1879 map showing the main railroad lines in the U.S. This is an 1893 map showing the main railroad lines in the U.S. This is an 1899 map of railroad lines in the Mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. This is a 1911 map of railroad lines in the Mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. This is the Horseshoe Curve in Pennsylvania on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Expansion into the Interior The first railroad in North America to Baltimore and Ohio was chartered by Baltimore merchants in 1827, and construction began in 1830. The first regularly scheduled steam-powered rail passenger service in the U.S. began operation in South Carolina in 1830, utilizing the U.S.-built locomotive the best friend of Charleston. By 1840, there were more than 2,800 miles of railroad in operation in the U.S and by 1850 there were more than 9,000 miles of railroad. This is as much as in the rest of the world combined. By 1860, the total miles of track exceeded 30,000 miles. In 1862, President Abraham Lincoln formally inaugurated the transcontinental railroad construction that would ultimately link California with the rest of the nation. This was completed in 1869. Congress designated four feet, eight and one half inches as the gauge for the transcontinental railroad. Eventually, this gauge became the industry standard. And since 1887, nearly all U.S. railroads have been this width. The first phase of American railroad development, from 1828 until about 1850, most commonly involved connecting two relatively large cities that were fairly close neighbors. New York City, New Haven, Connecticut, Richmond, Virginia, and Washington, D.C or Syracuse and Rochester, New York were examples of this phase of Eastern Railroad development. By 1852, there were six crossings of the Appalachian Mountain chain, which were essentially incremental alignments of railroads first proposed to tie neighboring cities together, and there was a need for a new strategy of routing. The B&O projected a line from Wheeling to Cincinnati, Ohio, and on to the east bank of the Mississippi opposite St. Louis, then the greatest mercantile city in the American interior. The Pennsylvania Railroad reached Pittsburgh in 1852, and the company began to seek the merger of second phase railroads in the Midwest into a line from Pittsburgh to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and thence to Chicago, which was emerging as the dominant junction of the vastly productive agricultural and industrial region of the eastern prairie states. The first railroad from the east reached Chicago in February 1852. And soon after that, lines we pushed toward the Mississippi and the Missouri Rivers. In 1859, the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad was completed to the Middle Missouri Valley.
It remained the most westerly thrust of the railroad during the Civil War. By the beginning of the 1850s, it had already become clear that there would be considerable pressure to undertake a transcontinental railroad. The Golden Age of Railroads began in about 1865, and for nearly half a century, no other mode of transportation challenged railroads. During these years, the rail network grew from 35,000 miles in 1865 to a peak of around 254,000 miles in 1916. Before the Transcontinental Railroad and the Telegraph, communication and transportation to the West was by means of the Pony Express and the stagecoach. The Pony Express was an express mail service that used relays of horse mounted riders. It operated from April 3, 1860, to October 26, 1861, between Missouri and California. The Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company operated it. During its 18 months of operation, the Pony Express reduced the time for messages to travel between the east and west coasts of the U.S. to about 10 days. It became the most direct means of communication to the West before the first transcontinental telegraph was established, October 24, 1861. It was vital for tying the new U.S. state of California with the rest of the United States. This is an advertisement for Pony Express riders. Despite a heavy subsidy, the Pony Express was not a financial success and went bankrupt in 18 months when a faster telegraph service was established. Nevertheless, it demonstrated that a unified transcontinental communications system could be established and operated year-round. When replaced by the telegraph, the Pony Express quickly became romanticized and became part of the lore of the American West. Its reliance on the ability and endurance of hardy riders and fast horses was evidence of the rugged American individualism of the frontier times. Wells Fargo began when prosperous New York businessmen Henry Wells and William Fargo saw a great opportunity in the West after gold was discovered. They created Wells Fargo and Company in 1852 with the primary objectives of providing transportation and banking. In California, where no railroads yet existed, the Wells, Fargo and Company Express planned to provide express services to the many miners flooding the area and freight services to businesses. The banking division of Wells Fargo and Company Express advertised financial services and general forwarding businesses for mail, valuable deliveries, and freight. Within the year, Wells Fargo established its first office in San Francisco, followed by offices in Sacramento, Monterey, and San Diego, and then in almost every mining camp in California. One of its earliest and most important tasks included transporting gold from the Philadelphia Mint, a service Wells Fargo retained until a United States Mint was opened in San Francisco in April 1854. Another essential task serviced by Wells Fargo was mail delivery. Post offices were first established in California in 1848, but the public preferred the express companies as they were cheaper and faster than the U.S. mail. This is a Wells Fargo stagecoach. By 1855, mining activity had declined in California, and several banks failed. However, Wells Fargo remained, soon to become the dominant express and banking organization in the West. At that time, they were the only company making large shipments of gold and continued to serve miners by delivering mail and supplies.
in its early days. Wells Fargo did not operate its stagecoaches. Instead, it subcontracted and invested in those already in business. They were primarily an express company. In 1857, Wells Fargo helped back the New Overland Mail Company, which provided regular twice-a-week mail service between St. Louis and San Francisco. The Overland Mail Company was organized by men with extensive interests in four leading express companies, Wells Fargo American Express United States Express and Adams Express. John Butterfield, one of the founders of American Express, was made president of the new company, with Wells Fargo being its primary lender. Nicknamed the Butterfield Line after its president, the Overland Mail ran 2,757 miles through the southwest via El Paso, Tucson and Los Angeles before arriving in San Francisco. The route was the longest stage line in the world. The trek over deserts and mountains took about 25 days, stopping only to change horses or for passengers to get food. Recommended Videos, Railroad Part 1 Recommended video, How Do Steam Locomotives Work, Steam Engines Explained Recommended video, How Do Steam Engines Work Recommended video, Steam Engine, How Does It Work Recommended video, How a Steam Engine Works Recommended video, James What's Steam Engine? Recommended video, Steam Engine How Does It Work? Recommended video, The First Trains of the Industrial Revolution Trains that Changed the World Absolute History Recommended video, The American Railroad, A History Recommended video, How a Steam Locomotive Works, Union Pacific Big Boy Recommended video, How a Diesel Electric Locomotive Works Recommended video, The Transcontinental Railroad, The History of American Westward Recommended video, The Transcontinental Railroad Unites America. Recommended video, History of American Railroads, explained in 20 minutes. Recommended video, Amtrak's Next Generation of High Speed Rail. Recommended video, YouTube Navigation. Table of Contents. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.